executive leaders and uh, with executive leaders and teams in the Middle East. That's where we met. And we also have a um, mixed background. Um, Benita is an MCC, Belinda is a PhD, and I am ACTC. And I think all of these um, acronyms make sense to you as um, it seems like most of you are coaches here. Uh, is, it, is it Darius? Do you, do you know these acronyms? Yeah, who doesn't know the acronyms? Yeah. Please let us know. You do? Okay, good. Okay. So now, please let us know who are you. It's a slider poll. Um, and you can either scan the QR code with your phone or you can type in slido.com and then put the number in and it's going to take you to the poll. Um, and that will give us an idea what what uh, level of discussion we can have with you and engagement um, that would like to get from you. So we'll see the results coming on screen as soon as you start filling in. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to find it soon. And it's a multiple, uh, you can pick many things if you're not just only a leader or a coach, uh, if you're both, you can also answer. Sorry, I cannot uh, find my way to answering this. Can you repeat please how to go about? Uh... Um, either with the QR code on your phone, or if that doesn't, uh, uh, you don't want to do that, then if you go on your computer to slido.com and type in the number 2424183, then it's going to take you to the right vote. So three people who have answered are coaches, but they are also doing training, facilitation, and they are also leaders. And how many people do we have, Eleni, at the moment? So I know if I'm going to close it or if we keep it open for a bit. Well, uh there are around eight people expected to answer all right okay so we have 50 percent i'll give it another minute to see if if you have issues or, or you're not going to vote uh please uh, let us know in the chat so we won't be waiting for you Okay. Yeah. I think this is it for now. This is it for now. Thank you very much for those who have answered and um, it's completely okay not to answer. Oh, there's one more person. Excellent. We have five people. <laughs> Thank you. So you have HR professional, leader, and we have uh, coaches and facilitators in the room. Thank you very much. So, what we would like to do in this session is to define the resilient organization together. And I am going to hand it over here to Benita. Okay, thanks, Abby. So, uh, I, th nice to meet you all, by the way. And uh, thank you for to uh, Angelos and Lenny for inviting us today to speak to you. And our intention when we talk about building a resilient organization, yeah, our intention today is not to give you 
five things that you absolutely must do to build a resilient organization, five or 10 or two. But to talk about what does that mean and how, how might we build it? Uh, this is not about being faster, smarter, or better, which is our, sort of our past paradigm of looking at things. If we're only faster, better, or smarter, we'll be resilient. We think it's much broader than that today. Um, and we, what we're looking at is how do we be ready or prepare for things that we can't be ready for? And of course, our huge example from the past is COVID. Nobody was ready for that. And we had to learn as we went through it. So today we, we want to look at how do we how do how do organizations and the people in organizations be ready for what they can't be ready for. So we've worked with a lot of international organizations and we're we'll share the things that we've seen and we hope uh, we'll open the floor to some. We're going to have a discussion. I'm going to turn this over to Belinda now, who is uh, one, wondering how you define a resilient organization. And if you can. It's yours, Belinda. OK, thanks, Benita. Um, hello, everybody. Lovely to see you. Um, from that poll that Abe put up, it looks like we've got very experienced people in the room. And um, we have our perspectives from the context we're in, but we're curious how resilience is talked about or described in the organisations that you work in and work with. And we'd like to use the chat for this part of the discussion. So we would invite you please to put into the chat, what would your the organisations you're working in, um, what, how would they describe resilience? Ability to handle change effectively. Thanks, it's a lot. Yeah, thank you, Evelyn. Organizational resilience is the ability to cope with the crisis well, and also that you recover from it well. And Jenny, thank you. The ability to quickly bounce back from difficulties. Ah, Manolis, being a wise champion to all we do. Interesting. Interesting. Great. Well, thank you. I don't see any any anybody else typing at the moment, so I'm I'm going to move on because I think we've got that will give us more time later to discuss together. So thank you for sharing those those insights. That was super interesting to see the, the similarities. Um, so our definition for now is, um, as Benita's already talked about, that resilient, that resilient organisations are aware of and talk about the need to be prepared for things that they can't be prepared for. So just to say that again, um, resilient organisations are aware of and talk about the need to be prepared for things that they can't be prepared for. So now I'd like to hand back to uh, Benita and Abe uh, to speak a little bit more about how we might develop this kind of resilient practice. Thanks, Belinda. Abby, are you going to bring up the slides now, or are we? So I, I can. Just... Okay. I can. Yeah. So this this slide is. Um, 
a slide from Maslow Research Center, which talks about four areas of focus in organizations. Here we go. Um, and so the, the sort of two traditional ways that we think about organizations is we think about strategy and operations. Um, that, that has been with us for uh, a long period of time and is a pretty solid practice, I would say, in most organizations, at least in most organizations that I work with. Um, but unfortunately, strategy and operations, we don't believe are going to prepare you for what you can't prepare for. So we're looking at, at two new pieces to add to that picture. One is culture and the other one is leading, it, it, which is leading the people in the organization. So both culture and leading are about the people side of the business and the strategy and operations are about the process side. The culture, yeah, the culture and the strategy are kind of looking from a higher level and looking at the people and the operations is looking at it from a, a smaller micro as opposed to a macro level. Um, and the culture and the people are more about feeling and strategy and operations are more about thinking. And I would, I would hope that most of you would agree that m the majority of the focus on organizations has been on thinking. We have to think faster, better than we did before. And so we're going to talk about these other two pieces a little bit because we believe that they haven't been spoken about a lot in as organizations are thinking about resilience. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Avi to talk about culture and then I'll talk about the people piece. So Avi? Yeah, thank you. Yes, the culture I think is very much now uh, come to a topic um, in, in lots of organizations and um, people are trying to define what it is and very often they end up um, with okay we're going to have some nice events for our people and that we will be uh, organizing um, uh, lunches together and get a better coffee and things like that but when we talk about culture here it's it's really in the sense of um, how do we do things here and um, like Manita was mentioning um, but strategy and operations, if this is the main thing that people uh, talk about only, uh, that's the way we do things here. We do not think about people, we do not think about culture, strategy, operations are the main pillars of that. Um, and in order to bring in culture and people into, into the organizations, um, this, is, uh, this is actually that is helping to uh, build more resilient organizations because as we coaches know um, we can think all we want but we can't think ourselves out of a bad feeling <laughs> um, and the same thing applies to um, not just to individuals but to um, but to organizations as well so um, it's it's a um, it's really redefining um, how do we want to do things here and obviously you have to have your strategy in place. You have to know what your purpose is, where you're going and why you want to achieve what you want to achieve. And then uh, your culture can support that. Um, very often we can see very nice values on the walls uh, of the companies we go to work at. Um, it's about honesty, it's about supporting each other. And, um, you know, when you've been in an organization for a little bit, then you realize that these are just really nice values and um, they're not really meant to be observed in day to day life. So it, it the culture is really helping um, bring the values into life in an organization and supports the execution of strategy. And how do people belong into culture, Belinda? Benita. Okay. Oh, Benita, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm, I still mix you up. I've known you so long and I still mix your names up. <laughs> so uh, just as a, uh, just to, 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 to back that up a little bit, I'll say we define culture as a, uh, using McKinsey's definition that the culture is the set of behaviors that we see every day in organizations. 
So just to, if you think about value, it, do we, the values are important. The, the culture is the behaviors that we see. It's nice, as Abby said, nice to have those on the wall, but what's actually happening? So that's the everyday behaviors. And so culture is not just about um, what the leadership team is doing, it's what everyone in your organization is doing and how do you care for that? When we look at people, people are becoming, it, it, it's starting to become a topic now in organizations. So we've always had strategy, we've always had transfer, um, high performing operations. We're starting to be concerned about people and just barely starting to talk about culture. But when we think about people, it's the, that's the only thing that can prepare us for what we can't be prepared for. It isn't about do you have a building or not? Because you may not have a building, but you'll always have people. So how how do we nurture and care for the people in our organization? There's processes that need to that that you have that help nurture and care for people. But what we would like to invite you to think about here is how do you mentor people? How do you coach them? So this is a, a more um, micro level of how you care for your people. It's not the only way you care for them. We want to always emphasize that it's four pieces and they all have to work together. But instead of focusing on, it's good to have an onboarding policy, but what happens with them? What do we do after for them? So if we're not taking care of our people, what's going to happen when that crisis comes? And it could be anything. We, we have to be prepared for what we don't know today which makes us go cross-eyed, I think, most of the time. We say, I have to be prepared for what I can't be prepared for. That sounds like a conflict. But I'm going to suggest that that's what we deal with every day. People who get up in the morning and come to work, they don't know what's going to happen. And it still sits in the back of people's heads. What if there's a financial crisis? What if there's another health crisis? What, what is my organization doing? What can I do to help that? So the people piece becomes one of the four pieces that we need to be paying attention to. How do we lead our people? How do we mentor them? How do we coach them? How do we care for them? If we want to be resilient, we have to think about that. And I'm going to say that's different for every organization. That's one of the things that people often think is, is there's one answer to this question, how I take care of my people. I'm going to say that really is dependent on the business you're in, the market that your business is in and how volatile that market can be, how much are you affected by global circumstances? So that changes depending on the size of your organization, what market you're in and what, you're, what you believe your future is. That will, that will help mold how resilient you need to be. Um, so I would, I would, in, Isadora, so you're having that look on your face, like, what is she talking about? <laughs> what, what is it that I'm not being clear about there? I'm just trying to relate uh, what you say to what uh, I am experiencing in the company. Okay. And um, uh, I am, uh, I'm working in the industry the last uh, 15 years <clears throat> uh, with, uh, you know, strong brand names and uh, not, not a lot of, um, uh, let's say, important market changes affecting the organization. Okay. Uh, but still, still, uh, there, is, uh, there is change everywhere and um, we have to prepare ourselves and uh, the people. And I found it very, very interesting what you say that things may, everything, everything may change, but uh, you have the people on board and this is the tool of how you, you, you overcome uh, things. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, let me, let me mention because we're a small group that I'm taking notes on the other screen I have. Okay. Uh, so I'm not I'm not surfing in the you know I'm not on Facebook or anything. Just, <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
No, Good this, to this know is something you with I, us. <laughs> yeah, this is something I always mention, you, you know, uh, in these uh, web meetings. Yeah. And thank you, thank you for sharing that. Now. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to Belinda, who uh, is going to just give us a quick recap, I believe, of some of the things that we, some of the, uh, some of the thoughts or feelings for you to chew on, I guess we'll call it, to chew on them. Um, and then I believe you're going to open a discussion, uh, Belinda, for more input for people like Isadoras and for the others on the call, what they're seeing. So it's all over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Benita. Um, yes, I think it's going to be, we, we'll, we've got a little bit more um, in presentation mode and then we're going to throw the floor open and, and talk about this in practice. So just to summarise what we've been um, saying in the last few minutes is that in the past, leaders of organisations have been pretty good at being operators. So operations work well. They're great strategists. Strategies are in place. And that's not enough anymore. Leaders need to be culture builders. We need intelligence. We need smart, deep thinking, and that's not enough either. We also need emotional intelligence, and that's not enough. We need co leaders who are coaches and mentors. Um, that's coaching, mentoring, and mentoring are good structures that we can put in place into our resilient organizations. But when coaching is individual, it's valuable, but we believe that resilience requires or more importantly, demand systemic connection. So looking towards a more systemic connection, we might go to team coaching, which does contribute in, in, from our perspective, but that's not enough either because team coaching tends to be um, with the senior leaders. So it's great and it's not enough to build resi resilient organisations. Uh, Paul Lawrence and Susie Skinner's research, and um, Manolis, you mentioned the word wisdom. So yes, we need wisdom, and we also need time and space and structures and rituals to build community so that uh, we can be prepared for these things. They can't be prepared for, um, hopefully, from the, paint, the picture that we're painting here with words, um, it's clear that we believe that resilience is complex. But more importantly, we believe that resilience is developed for and by everyone in the organisation. It's no one particular group's responsibility. Abe. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to that um, a practical example. Um, when I was working with a company and I introduced this, uh, the same chart that uh, we showed you here about um, strategy, operations, culture and leadership, then it was, um, then, and I asked people like, how are you as leaders contributing? Then they had it all divvied up. Oh yeah, he's strategy, he's operations, he takes care of the leadership and, and obviously everybody pointed towards the HR saying, oh yeah, and she does our culture. <laughs> And uh, and th this is a paradigm uh, shift that we're really talking about here. Um, you cannot actually separate and you know compartment compartmentalize um, those four things. Um, you have to cultivate the leaders to be able to handle all four. Um, uh, obviously, HR cannot take care of the culture alone. Um, it has to be behaviors built in uh, with, the, with the entire leadership tree team. I saw a lot of uh, friendly smiles there, so I am um, happy happy to hear what what that sparked for you when I mentioned that. If somebody wants to jump in and just uh, say what you were smiling about. Yeah, I want to say that uh, um, you know, you, you see sometimes that um, um, they expect from the HR guy to sort of take care of the whatever people issue, problem, uh, you know, just uh, automatically just take care of it, you know, you know how to do, take care of it. And uh, this, um, 
this is not the way because uh, in the same way that uh, I should be aware of uh, the hard financial data in the company and the strategy and so on, also the managers in the company have to manage, have to manage the people because um, from my perspective, primarily they, their role is uh, to manage the group of people who do the work and uh, they are not um, uh, standalone contributors. Uh, their primary role is to manage the people. So um, I very much value what you say that um, everybody in a management, for example, should uh, should be to a certain extent into all these four uh, four aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. I would just like to to present now just uh, another thought that it, so one of the things that uh, one of the ideas that's being thrown around a lot is that in the future, speaking of HR, we, we will no longer have um, our people will not be defined by the role that they take in the organization. They will be defined by the skills and capabilities and value they bring. And so they will we will become I, I would like to say it's project like but it, it that's probably giving it a limited view so i won't i won't i won't become like so i'll use myself as an example i'm a managing consultant for an hr consultancy i will no longer have that title and that role but i will be a coach sometimes i will be a manager sometimes i will be a supervisor sometimes I'll be a team coach, an individual coach. I'll be a culture coach. I'll work with all different departments, sharing my areas of expertise on different projects that the company is uh, putting forward. So that's that idea sometimes throws people completely, well, what do you mean I won't have a job anymore, <laughs> right? And raises fears beyond belief, right? And then you throw in the element of, oh yeah, and, AI is going to do a lot of your work and then we put people into fear again and we double that fear. Mm -hmm. So when we think about resilient organizations, I, you know, it you can have all kinds of policies about why they shouldn't be afraid. It, are, is that going to stop the fear? No, I don't believe it is. I believe that one of the really good tools for being able to help with this fear is team coaching. So imagine if every project that people are working on, they have a team coach because the team coach is, is not going to be limited to, it won't be by structure or in the organization. It's, oh, only the senior leaders get team coaching. No, this project is very important to our future. And this project, the team working here, which is these 10 people at the moment, will be working with a team coach. So I think that's one of the things that we're going to see an increase in in short term. I don't I don't you know I don't know that for sure, but I'm thinking as we're getting ready for those kinds of things to happen, what kind of tools can we use that we know exist today that we may have to reinvent? Right? So I find it fascinating when I think about resilience to think about just be able to to be curious enough and playful enough to look at well, what would happen if we had no roles in our organization? What would our people do? <laughs> and and have some discussions within your organization about ask the people. What do they think? I don't know if you ask everyone in the organization, but you know, perhaps there's different, um, what do we call them, focus groups or whatever you want to call them, that discuss that just to get ready. Or what might come we don't know you know is ai going to take over everyone's job eh, some people would agree some people would say no but we don't know it's one of the things we do not know so how do we think about um working in organizations what what kind of tools do we have now and what kind of tools might we reinvent to be so our organizations are resilient and so I talked a lot. And Athena, you have your hand up. Uh, because you asked why you smile uh, uh, on what you mentioned, 
I was thinking that as we step as coaches in, in, in organization, it looks like, to me at least, uh, that uh, what you said that culture is how we, how we do things in the, in the, the business. Okay, it looks like that they haven't realized the impact and the result it has in their whole culture and whole, uh, whole uh, development of the business. They don't understand the connection between how things done and how this impacts their, uh, the whole organization. That's why the, I'm, I'm looking right now as a coach. I'm a new coach, okay, but as I step in the organization system, but what I see, they don't understand the connection sometimes, mm -hmm. most of the times. Yeah. And there is, the, there is the work we have to do with all the tools and the diagnostics we have to, to, to connect the dots between how things is done and how this impacts the organization. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for that, Athena, because I think that brings another really uh, interesting topic when we talk about uh, resilience. As coaches, how resilient are we? Um, we're, so I think we're really starting to see a blending between coaching and consulting. And a coach might be a consultant. A consultant might be a coach. But it's really important that we recognize the difference between those two. And we're really clear with our clients. Okay, I can also offer consulting. Because I can see things in the organization that sometimes you don't see. Right? Especially external coaches. They get a they you just get all kinds of data about an organization that you don't share because of confidentiality. So there's also an invitation as as in our profession to think about how are we being resilient? How are we as coach as the as the coaching business? How are we preparing for that? I think it's a fascinating question. Don't have an answer. I have some possibilities, possibilities to think about. So I really think that's what a rebuild. We said building resilience. We didn't say you will now be resilient. I'll wave a magic <laughs> wand. Do these ten things. You're resilient. <laughs> We're, we're always building that. And we do that with curiosity and wisdom. And I also really love, Athena, how you um, just pointed that, you know, everything starts with awareness. If you're not aware, you cannot do anything. Um, so in order to become aware how your practices and behaviors are impacting your everyday life, you need to be aware of that first. And yes, very often we as coaches or consultants um, can actually uh, help people see. And then, yes, then they are ready to uh, put in new practices um, that serve them better and help the organization along the strategy rather than sometimes it's going the opposite way. Any other thoughts or comments that you'd like to share with us? Go ahead, Athena. Oh, no. Okay. The computer double click sometimes. <laughs> the computer is lower than I know that feeling. Uh, how about Manolis? Oh, no, Athena? I, 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 will, I will do the, the, the question that you asked. Like, how as coaches can we be more resilient? Yeah. And I know that there is not a one or two or three question, as you said, Benita, but um, there's surely ways like uh, staying in our shoes as coaches, uh, is they have um, a, a lot of. Um, um, Mentor, but I think there's more than that for us to be resilient. So, yeah. what we should do? Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what do we need to be prepared for that we can't be prepared for? Right? What, did, what did coaches do in COVID? What did, what did, what happened? We went to virtual coaching. 
it emerged. But we didn't put a strategy in place before that saying, oh, if something happens in the world, I'm going to be a virtual coach. Did anybody plan that ahead of time? No. But we were ready, not everyone, but we were ready to say, hey, okay, now we have this. What, what, what are the possibilities? Right? And if we haven't invested in ourselves, we probably were re resilient. We're, we're not resilient, but resistant. Right? You know, you know, I think when I first started coaching in the 90s, um, at that time, you know, you signed a one year contract for coaching and you met two times a week, period. And there was no alternative. That's what we did. And I look at it now and I think one of the beautiful things about coaching is becoming more on demand, especially with the newer generation. They want they want on demand services. So how as coaches or HR people or as leaders in organizations, how are we getting ready for that? On everything will, will become more and more on demand. Maybe, but are we preparing for that? And if I can just jump in there, that makes me think, Benita, about um, the power or the increasing um, application of supervision for coaches. As, as coaches, and we're going into these very complex um, situations and holding space for very complex and large numbers of systemic things happening, I believe that, you know, Supervision is going to play a big, even bigger role. And um, Angelos, thank you very much for this opportunity here, because I think that this kind of gathering of people who are thinking about this kind of topic and gathering together from all over the world to share what we're sensing in the field is hugely valuable. For me, that's part of, of building my resilience you know, to, to, to see where those outliers are and to start to think about things and see patterns. And, and I, I thank you. Thanks, Belinda. Uh, and uh, Manolis, I'm curious. You, were, you wrote in the chat that you said we needed wisdom. And I'm curious about what you meant by that. What, what is wisdom? <laughs> well, wisdom can be defined by several ways, I guess. But uh, my favorite one is uh, the ability to navigate through the knowledge. Navigate through the? Through knowledge. Through knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Oh, because in, in our era, there are uh, uh, probably there is a way to access every knowledge created in the world through the computer systems and the AI systems and all that stuff. But the wisdom we need now is how to navigate through the whole the whole place of wisdom, yeah? the whole valley of wisdom we are that's available now for everyone, almost everyone. Okay. So one thing is this. And there are other things that, like how do you make decisions, or uh, how do you know in what age is the organization, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking about uh, speaking about uh, resilience in the organizations, one very interesting thing that you might uh, want to investigate further. Uh, is how resilience can be redefined or defined in any stage of the uh, age of the organization. And when I'm saying age, I don't mean the number of years that the organization exists. But uh, according to my favorite professor, this is, uh, who has wrote a, a, a magnificent book life cycles. He defines the age uh, like we defined the mental age uh, of a human being. If you if you have uh, run into this book, 
uh, any time. And so we can start from the beginning with the startup uh, uh, company, and then we go to infancy, then to adolescence, and then the organization reach, uh, needs, uh, reaches to prime. And then the big, uh, the big issue there is how do we stay of the organization can stay to prime. Yeah. This is a difficult thing because if we don't find a way, uh, find, find a way to to keep the organization in prime stage, then we have an instability coming. The probably all the diseases, that, in quotes, that. Uh, we, we see the organization like aristocracy, bureaucracy, recrimination, and all the stuff. And mm -hmm. finally, we have an organization dying. Yes. So what is resilience? How can we define or how is resilience related through all these stages? Yeah, yeah perfect. That would be a nice question. That's, yeah. that's, that's perfect, Manolis, because this is quite often, you know, if we look at statistics, Often after prime comes decline in, in many, you know, in the majority of organizations, they aren't here for the long run. You know, uh, uh, I used to, for a period of time in my career, I worked for General Electric. And I think at that time, it was one of the organizations, one of the original uh, companies that was listed on the stock market that was actually still in business. <laughs> so, if you, yeah, that was that was pretty shocking. I think there were seven companies, and the total stock may, may have been more or less, but it was around that number, because prime leads to decline. And how do we see that? And how do we stay resilient with? And we can take that also to ages and stages of our employees. You know, our resilience will be completely different if we have all baby boomers on staff. Completely different if we have all fresh graduates. So that's why, you know, when we talk about resilience, it's looking at our organization, the stage it's at, looking at the stages our people are in, looking at the markets, it's looking at, at the complexity of everything and saying, okay, 80 if 15% if of my staff are baby boomers and they're gonna retire within the next five years, what does that mean? How resilient is my organization, am I ready? For that, and then what if they don't retire? <laughs> right. So there's all everything uh, is ages and stages. And thank you for saying it's how we navigate through the knowledge. So thank you for that, Manolis. It's beautiful. Thank, thank you too, Benita, for and uh, and Iva and uh, Benita for all this uh, nice knowledge you've been sharing for with us today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Jenny, we haven't heard from, oh, Lena, you have your hand up, sorry. I'm the one who has the hand up. I was just, uh, I wanted to add that as a representative of the younger generation of workers, uh, what I think you've, you've touched on a little bit, but for us, I think uh, it's transparency that brings resilience. Because mm -hmm. uh, when there is so, so much going on in the world, it's, it brings a kind of a fatigue to always try to monitor what is going on in the organization and trying to um, trying to peek through people who withhold information and do not let you know what which stage the organization is in. So transparency needs to like be in a priority in every department of a company. When anybody makes a decision, they have to figure out how we're going to let everyone know, how we're going to let everyone in the loop. And so younger generations really appreciate this and find it useful, I think, to remain resilient. Yeah, very, very nice, Lena. Uh, Lenny. The, uh, one, of the, one, of my, one of the things that used to just drive me crazy when I would hear this was uh, that information is above your pay grade. Really? <laughs> Well, guess what? That's great. I'm gonna put it on on a shirt. I think. <laughs> it's like, oh, why am I coming to work then? <laughs> you know, anything you'd like me to do that's above my pay grade, or shall I only do what's in my pay grade? <laughs> you know. So you know that contributes to a little bit to resilience too, and it, it's also what avi has been talking about, and Belinda's been talking about about having communities 
and having those discussions. Um, that's transparency of information and even transparency, transparency about what, you know, where we might go. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Angelos, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, in my, it's my impression that when we talk about resilience, we talk about the need, the potential need of a company to uh, react, regroup, and uh, act given the specific challenge, which an external challenge usually. Am I right? Now, as we're looking at what is happening at the workplace right now, where there are four generations, and it looks like it's, it will be or there is a clash of cultures. I mean, I was reading the other day that uh, the, uh, the, the big resignation uh, wave number two is anticipated. Uh-huh. And yeah, so it seems like uh, there's a need of managing the culture or the cultural clash inside the organization. So how can you define this kind of need for resilience, of internal resilience? So, you know, yeah, Angelos, that's a really good point, because I don't think um, it's always just about being prepared for external events. It's also being about internal. That's a huge part of your organization. Like I said, if if you have 50% baby boomers and they're going to all retire, you got a different problem. Than you do if you have 50% new graduates and they're they're wanting to grow and develop and try and try out their skills. So it depends on the organization. It isn't it the, the thing about resilience, it's not limited. It's not just internal, it's not just external. And it depending on your organization, it's up to you to it's up to you, it, it's an invitation to you to identify, okay, what is it that could that could um, lead to our demise? <laughs> <laughs> or are stopping or going to the next stage in this organization. So you know, this class of the class, class, clash of the different cultures is perfect. Having a look at that in your culture plan. You know, that's an important piece. How, how, how does the communication happen? As Lenny said, what's the communication there? How are you communicating to all of those four different generations? It's no longer one message. Right, it, it it can't be. And, got and so actually, much. actually, I mean, external circumstances is just one part or, or like one reason for demise of the companies. Very often, companies collapse under their own weight. Just like when we're talking about General Electric, for example, they were growing, 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 and now they're coming back down. Um, so it's it's very much about internal resilience and understanding even, even the difference. Like when I change the strategy, I really need to look at my culture. Um, I really need to look at the leadership I have in place and, and the operations because you can't sort of expect to go in a different direction and keep everything the same. So, so very much um, about uh, internal uh, pros- processes and internal uh, culture uh, as well. Yeah, you know, uh, because it, because I guess I'm really old. Like I'm, I'm I got to tell you, I'm really old. But I had the privilege of working for IBM for a while. And in the years when you know IBM were, were the king of the castle in technology, like you know, don't even anybody else mention any other name. It's only IBM. And and I was working in that industry when their demise started. It's like all of a sudden they've got competitors, and oh, you're not, you know, you're not so arrogant as you were going to tell us the customer what to do. Because in in the prime days of IBM, they gave directive to their clients what they couldn't couldn't do, and that that disappeared. That was challenged, and it was fascinating to watch how they met that challenge. They weren't prepared for it. You know, they just thought they would be the king of the castle forever. Um, they weren't prepared for it, but I was really impressed with how they changed um, their customer relationships, their internal relationships, their external relationships, because the market was demanding it. So it was, it was, you know, and it was rather simple in those days. It wasn't as complex as it is today. So the, we never know. <laughs> We we really that's what that's what we're saying resilience is about. It isn't about knowing. It isn't having the answer. It's about 
being willing to look at what are what are possibles and how do we think about them? How do I think about, Lenny, how do I think about the your generation of workers in my organization? What, what do they need? That's culture. What about people like me who are still working? I have different needs. So what, what's, you know, how do we, as Angelo has rightly said, how do we bring all of those four generations in one organization together with with some wisdom it's it's a fascinating question and as belinda said you know gatherings like this where you talk to other people who are who are uh, grappling with these ideas is one of the ways we can do that yeah because some um, of those things are just so complex it's hard to comprehend on your own but when yeah. you start discussing with people that's when uh, some pieces of clarity, like the clouds behind me, they start appearing. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we realize that, that we are, are getting close to the end of our time. And we, we really, Jenny, we didn't hear anything from you. Do you have anything you'd like to say before we close? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was thinking what you said and what Eleni said, everybody, and also when Oli said, Yes, it's wisdom and different generations, different experiences, different uh, inputs that we can uh, all bring into the organization. And then we should listen to each other <laughs> in a coaching way. I mean, listening. So understanding and the other people's perspective and OK, combine all these perspectives because this is very useful uh, for and I now connect uh, resilience with sustainability of organizations. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the screen that I don't see that I've missed here? Would like to say something? So I think we're good. I, are we running a little bit over time? I'm not sure, but if we are, our apologies. It's been a fascinating conversation. So on behalf of Belinda and Ave, I would I would give a huge sense of gratitude to you for joining us and being so open to our conversations today. It's been delightful. And again, a big thank you to Angelos for inviting us and a big thank you for Lenny for being such an awesome coordinator. She's kept us on track. So thank you so much. Ave or Belinda, do you have anything you'd like to say just quickly in closing? I, it's been really lovely conversation. I very much enjoyed meeting all of you and thanks for all of your contributions. Um, it's it's like one of those things that every time we talk about it, we learn something new from new people. So thank you for teaching us today. Yes, and I'm glad, I'll be glad of the recording and I've, I've got notes galore. So um, thank you for, for feeding our conversations too. Okay. Thank you. It was amazing that you joined us. We hope to see you soon. And everyone, don't forget to check out the, the upcoming events as well. Uh, we have another uh, webinar in two hours and another one tomorrow. So I hope I'll see you there. Enjoy. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. It was very nice seeing you again. And Belinda, very nice getting to know you, meeting you for the first time. Thank, Thank you all very you. much. Thank you, Angelus. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks.